Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. Uh, lucky enough to get promoted while I was still on 5 Squadron, uh, so I spent five or six months overborne as a squadron leader on 5 and then went up to Leeming to set up my fourth Tornado Squadron from scratch. Uh, 11 Squadron were already up and running at Leeming and we arrived uh, 23 Squadron uh, as the second squadron, the third came along later, which was 25. So there were three squadrons actually at Leeming in the end. So what's the role it actually entail? Well, as the A flight commander, OCA, I was responsible for um, most of the pilots on the squadron. Uh, OCB flight was responsible for most of the navs. Um, not entirely, but that was the tender, because OCB was a navigator. There was a wing commander boss was a pilot, I as OCA was um, a pilot and OCB was a navigator. We also had uh, a weapons leader who was a squadron leader and a nav leader who uh, was a squadron leader nav. So there were five execs on the squadron um, and on top of that we had a squadron leader uh, engineering officer. Well. I did fly in the Gulf, I didn't actually fly in the shooting war. Um, what happened when Saddam Hussein invaded Iraq? I was actually at a, an air display down in Cornwall at St Morgan and in the middle of the afternoon, it was a Wednesday if I remember rightly, all of a sudden things started to, to move and uh, they stopped the display for a while and the Victor tanker that was there was dragged out of the static display and off he went and disappeared. Well, what's going on here? And of course there were no mobile phones then. So someone asked me to ring the squadron and he said, ah, right, well, Iraq have invaded Kuwait and it looks like um, we're going to have to go out and defend Saudi. Well, 11 squadron were already on uh, APC out in Akrotiri and uh, they went straight out to Dahran in Saudi Arabia as the initial people. When I got back to Leeming, we were told that we'd be working up for what became Operation Granby uh, or Desert Shield before the shooting started. After the shooting, it was Desert Storm. So that was in the August. And we've been told, we've been asking for some time for chaff and flares, and we've been told there was a new improved radar in the pipeline but we've been told it was a long way off so we were next day I remember we were in an HS125 being flown from Leeming two crews down to uh, Dunsfold which everyone will know now from Top Gear fame but uh, then it was uh, British Aerospace Airfield where they used to build the Harriers Anyway, we landed at Dunsfold in a taxi taken down to Shoreham, which is near Brighton, to a big building, uh, walked inside, and there was a Tornado F3 simulator in there. I said, what's this? He said, oh, well, it's got the new radar in it. You've come down to train on the new radar that you're going to have in the Gulf. What new radar? So anyway, the two crews were trained up um, over a three or four day period on this new radar, which was quite different, much more capable. Um, don't ask me the specifics, but I think the track well scan and the look down was a lot better from what I remember. And also the ECM um, resilience was much better than the one we had. So I asked, well, what, why have you got this radar in this simulator down here? He said, oh, well, it's actually, it's for the Saudis. They haven't got a building to put the simulator in yet. It was supposed to go out last month. We're just lucky it's still here. 
So the Saudis were going to get a more up-to-date radar than we had on the front line in the UK. Anyway, having trained with it, we went back to Leeming and then we found that we'd been asking for chaff and flares on the aeroplane and been told, no, 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 lead in time of two years, you can't have them yet, there's not enough money, you know, can't possibly have that. Well, they were on the aeroplane in just over 14 days and we were training with them. And at the back end of August, I think it was 28th, 29th of August, we went out to Dahran to relieve 11th Squadron and the people out there. It was, I was a flight commander on 23 at the time, as I said, but the squadron that went to Dahran initially was 11 Desert Eagles, commanded by OC-11. And it was a flight of crews from 11 Squadron, a flight of crews from 23, and a flight of crews from 25 Squadron who went out there. But we were known as 11 Squadron Dahran at the time. And we were flying combat air patrols up on the Iraqi border. We were out there until just before Christmas, um, obviously saw no action but uh, we did have some interesting moments we were on cap one day and uh, my navigator had seen a target and it was night time actually it wasn't day and he called it to the um, the AWACS and said we've got a target crossing the the, uh, the border and this is all on secure radio and the controller in the AWACS said no you haven't and uh, the navigator was quite insistent, he said, we have. He said, no, you haven't. Oh, okay. So we surmised it was special forces helicopters or something like that crossing the border. But uh, we, most of those sorties were four, four and a half hours uh, with tanker support from VC-10s at Bahrain. Um, fully armed all the time. And when we weren't on cap, we were doing training but again, fully armed with live weapons. And there were only two outfits who were trained with us. Um, the US Marines with their F-18s, they were quite happy to train with us. The US Air Force didn't want to know because we had live weapons. And our own British Jaguars and Tornadoes. So uh, it was a very interesting time, did a lot of flying um, then. Went back just before Christmas, as I said, I think we were replaced by 43. Um, who were there when it all kicked off in January. Uh, but as corollary to this, uh, at the end story, if you like, all the deep maintenance was done in UK. So the airplanes had to be rotated from UK through Dharan as the, the months went by. And I led a four ship of tornadoes out to Dharan to, re to swap over and bring some back for maintenance on the day that the war ended. And the ceasefire was 0500 on the 28th of February, which was exactly the moment that we took off from Leeming. And that was the longest flight I did in a tornado, over nine hours direct Leeming to Dahran. Uh, we landed there, we gave the aeroplanes to the squadron, had a night's sleep, and then went back to, U to UK. But because the engineering fraternity weren't comfortable about the wear that the engines had had, not just because of the lot of flying they'd been doing, but also the, the sand in the desert and what was going on. They were, weren't confident about the nine hour flight back. So we staged through Dechi Mamanu, which was about five hours, I think, from Dharan to Dechi. And we landed there and we were fated by everyone on the ground. Oh, you've just come from Dharan, the war's over, let me have a beer and we've got a barbecue organised for you because they thought we'd been out there for the war. They didn't realise we'd gone out the day before. So we didn't, uh, didn't enlighten them. We just enjoyed their hospitality and the next day flew back to UK. 